ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, great to be in Maine. It's great to be in Westbrook. I'm, uh, it's an honor to be here. Congratulations to all the award winners tonight. Uh, what a great group of people and projects uh, that we're going to hear from. Uh, I'm really kind of, uh, you know, humbled and embarrassed by that uh, so-called introduction. And, and, I, and I remember, that I, I'll just tell you a quick story, because uh, I've only got like 28 minutes to give a 45-minute talk. Uh, but the first time my wife showed up one of my talks, of course, I was really interested in what my wife thought about what I was going to have to say. So I went up to her after and said, what do you think, honey? She said, well, that was just fine. She said that the introduction was ridiculous. I said, oh, okay. She said, the only thing they didn't say about you is they didn't say you were a model husband. Now, did they? <laughs> and I said, no, that's a great idea. Maybe I'll add that to my bio. And she says, no, yeah, go home and look up the definition of model in the dictionary. If you look it up, it means a small replica of the real thing. <laughs> All right, so we're going to see if we can get this to uh, work. All right, great. Be in Maine, as I said before. Let me just, I'm going to go kind of fast. I've got a lot to say in a short time to say it. Well, so let's start off. I think none of you would disagree that this is a very special place that you live in. Maine is a place of great people, great history, great resources. I had a great tour today in Westbrook, and I think this is a community with great assets as well. But I want to tell you something. There is no place, no place in America today that will stay special by accident. And why is that? Because the world is changing faster than ever. You ever heard Yellow talk about this idea of change? And I understand that there are many people, particularly people in small towns in rural America, who do not like change. But I want to tell you something. There are only two kinds of change in the world that we live in today. There is planned change and there is unplanned change. I mean, you can anticipate the changes that are coming. You can prepare for them. You can shape and direct them in a way that you want. You can just let them happen. You can grow by choice or you can grow by chance. You can shape the future you want or you can create or you can accept the future you're given. In fact, Abraham Lincoln used to say that the best, excuse me, the best way to predict the future was to create it yourself. I think I'm going to walk around because I really can't see the screen from here, so I'm going to stand out here and hopefully you can hear me just about as well standing here so I can see what I'm talking about here. But you know, the truth is that what is uh, growth about? Growth is about choices. You know, should we be investing in our downtowns or out on the highway? Should we be investing in restoring our existing buildings or just tearing them all down and building new buildings? Should we be growing, should we be spreading out or should we grow more compactly? You know, what is growth about also? It's about this. It's about our children. What's tonight about our children, our grandchildren, the future, and preparing for the future? It's also about harmony and balance. It's about that relationship between conservation and economic development, between jobs and the environment, between buildings and nature, if you will. It's also, I believe, about trying to find win-win solutions to the problems that face us in America today. I tell you, I'm one of those people who believe we spend way too much time in America fighting about what we disagree about, and not nearly enough time sitting down community by community to talk about what we do and I want to tell you that when you do do that, you said you can reach consensus in small town America about what the future should be and what you like and what you love about the place that you live. So what's changing? And the answer to that is everything is changing. The economy, technology, demographics, consumer attitudes, market trends, health care, transportation, the weather is changing. You know, so, uh -oh. I'm running the show anyway. Let's see if you run down here for a second, see what we're doing here. All right, so what's changing? Everything's changing. You heard about Richard Florida earlier tonight. He's the author of that book, The Creative Class. He wrote another new book it's called The Great Reset. It's about how the economy post recession is changing everything in the world of development. He says how we live, work, shop, and move around is changing. Communities that prepare for the future will prosper, and those that do not will decline. All right, let's talk about the big sort going on. Yeah, there's a big sort going on. Unfortunately, we're becoming a country of winners and losers. That's a lot of what our political 
dysfunction and polarization is about today. When I graduated from college, you know, recruiters would come to your university and they would interview people. People would move to wherever they got a job. Today, young people figure out where they want to live. Then they move to that city and then they look for a job. So one of the great challenges in Maine and every other state is how do you get talented workers to want to come to where you are? How do you get young people to stay in your community? And the truth is, is that economic development, just like growth, is about choices. You've got lots of different choices. Should you spend all your time trying to recruit a new industry or should you be spending more time trying to grow the industries that you already have? You know, in business recruitment, yeah, that works for some people. But it's a, you know, most people are not going to win in this competition because you're in direct competition with thousands of other communities across America. We're only building a few hundred plants, factories, and distribution centers every year in America to do anything anymore. So how many communities are going to be successful in the you know, effort to get that one big thing to move to your community? So let's talk about how economic development has changed. When I was growing up in Alabama, I can tell you what our rural economic development plan was. Well, it was let's just widen all the highways. And then we lined the highways with a bunch of junk. We called that economic development. And it was all about low cost, low cheap labor, you know, cheap land, low cost gas, things like that. But I want to tell you something. No longer about shotgun recruitment, it's about laser recruitment. Not about cheap positioning. It's about high value business. It's not about cheap labor. It's about highly trained talent. It's not about what you don't have. It's about what you do have. We call that asset-based economic development. I want to tell you something. In the world we live in today, quality of life is critically important. You want people to move to your community? Think about quality of life. I'll show you a few examples of why that's important in just a minute. You know what, I want to suggest to you that the most important infrastructure investment in Maine is not roads, it is education. Education. <laughs> and as I heard, maybe heard me say on that video we did, economic development is rarely about the one big thing. I mean, for years in America, we had like an arms race to build the biggest convention center, for example. And of course, most communities would never have been in that arms race. And then it was festival marketplaces, which worked fine in places like Boston and Baltimore. But did you know there were 19 cities to build festival marketplaces that went bankrupt within three years? Places like Toledo or Jacksonville or Norfolk. You know, it was all about the copycat logic. Well, they did it work in Baltimore, it must have to work here. Then of course it was casinos, and then it was aquariums. So even a city like Camden, New Jersey, said that if we could just build an $80 million aquarium featuring the fish of New Jersey, <laughs> that we could save Camden. Well, they did build that aquarium. It's a great aquarium. But did it save Camden, New Jersey? No, it did not. Because successful economic development today is rarely about the one big thing. Much more frequently, it's about lots of little things working synergistically together off of a plan that makes sense. And you know, it's interesting that most job growth in America is in small business, but most of our subsidies go to big business. You know, the state of Wisconsin announced a couple of months ago they could give $3 billion to a Chinese company called Foxconn. $3 billion. And every economist who's looked at that deal said, you know, they might earn their money back in 40 years. You know, 40 years. So let me ask you this. What do you think makes more sense in economic development? Tax breaks and subsidies? Or creating a great place and training a skilled workforce? You know, one helps big business. One helps existing businesses. One builds long-lasting, durable economies. The other one, when the subsidies run out, they either leave or threaten to leave. You know, so which one of these is what you think would work best in a place like Maine? You know, we live in a world where capital is footloose. You can run a business anywhere in the world today. So why would you pick Westbrook over any other place? You know, I mentioned the idea of quality of life. Here's a guy, Foster Freeze, who owns one of the largest mutual fund companies in America called the Brain and Wine Investment Group. And it was headquartered outside of Philadelphia for about 40 years. Well, here's a guy who likes to fly fish. 
So what would he do every summer? He'd go out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming to go fly fishing. And then one day he's stuck in traffic on the Schuylkill Expressway outside of Philadelphia. And you know, all of a sudden the light bulb goes on his mind. He says, you know, hey, I can run a mutual fund company anywhere in the world. So what does he do? He picks up his entire company and moves it into downtown Jackson, Wyoming. That's the largest private sector employer in Jackson today. Why is he there? Access to outdoor recreation. Now, who, who would have thought that that was an economic development driver? But it is. You know, let's talk about you know this idea of you know. I think there are a couple of four four key factors in economic development. One is talent, attracting and retaining talented people. Innovation, generating new ideas and turning them into commercial realities. Connectivity, creating creating places where people and ideas can re, you know easily connect like a co-working space or an entrepreneur center or a downtown is a place where people and ideas can easily connect. But the thing we oftentimes forget about is this last thing. We already heard a little about tonight. It's the place that you live and the distinctiveness of that place. I want to suggest to you that successful communities are distinctive communities. Some of you have heard that slogan that Austin uses, keep Austin weird. Well, you know, that's kind of a funny slogan. But they also think of it as an economic development imperative. And what they mean is keep us on the cutting edge, keep us special, keep us different, keep us unique. They are the fastest growing city in America today. So, you know, what is it that sets you apart? Here's a new publication by the World Bank called The Economics of Uniqueness, and they basically go for 200 pages and talk about all the reasons why sameness is not a plus in America today. It is a minus. And once again, if you can't set your community or your project or your product apart, what advantage do you have? You know, Joe Courtright summed it up pretty well. He said, you know, the unique characteristics of a place may be the only truly, you know, defensible source of competitive advantage for cities and towns today. You know, nobody else can create a waterfall like you have right in this downtown. That is something that nobody else has. That's a thing that's worth enhancing and protecting and so on and so forth. Talk about Mark Twain. What did he say about this? He said, we take stock of the city like we take stock of a man. The clothes or appearance are the externals by which we judge. Let's think about a community's front door, its gateway. And just like with meeting a person, a good first impression is important and a bad first impression is hard to change. You think you'd rather visit the town of Franklin, Tennessee, or would you rather go to the town of Midfield, Alabama? <laughs> Which one looks more like a community with a sense of pride and a sense of place? Which one looks more like a community that you would rather invest time or money in? If you don't remember anything else I say tonight, remember this. The image of a community is fundamentally important to its economic well-being. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that every single day in America, people make decisions about where to live, where to invest, where to vacation, where to retire, based on what our communities look like. What they look like. Let's talk about tourism. Tourism is kind of important. It is the first, second, or third largest industry in every single American state. It's the biggest industry in the world today. You know, and check out the slogan for Oregon. It says, Oregon, things look different here. Can you imagine a state travel brochure that says something like me? Things look the same here. <laughs> well, of course not, because what is tourism? Tourism at its essence is visiting places that are different, unusual, and unique. The more any town in Maine comes to look just like every place else in America, the less reason there is to go there. On the other hand, the more a community does to enhance its uniqueness, whether that's historical, architectural, natural, cultural, artistic, whatever, the more people want to go there because that's exactly what tourism is. But you know, we've already heard about this the way the economy is changing, and I can tell you that place is more important than markets today in many, many ways. Here's a, you know, Steve McKnight, who runs a 
consulting company down in Pittsburgh. He says, new investment is increasingly sinking, seeking locations based on the quality of place rather than the utility of location. The National Association of Realtors put it, puts it this way. They said, the place is becoming more important than the product. And what would the realtors mean by that? What they mean is, what is going out on side out going on outside of a house is more important than what's going on inside of a house. The neighborhood has greater impact on the value of a house than the appliances, the size of the house, the number of square feet, whether you have a swimming pool, well, you name it. It's all about location, location, location. You know, Mick Cornell, who's the head of the Republican Mayor's Association, I think he sums it up pretty well. He says economic development is really the result of creating places where people want to be. You want to get your young people to stay in your town? Create a town that they want to stay in. Start involving young people on all your local committees and commissions and boards. Give them a say in their own future. And they may not stay there right away, but they might come back to raise their family. And that's the kind of thing we want to see in our communities. So what are some of the things that might set a community apart? I'm going to kind of just spend a few minutes on some of these. Anger institutions, healthy downtowns, historic buildings, walkable neighborhoods, parks, arts and culture, local shops, etc. Let's talk about downtowns for a second. Why are downtowns important? Well, first and foremost, because the downtown is the heart and soul of any community. As I said in that video, if you don't have a healthy downtown, you simply don't have a healthy town. I mean, think about it. The apple rots from the inside out. You know, it's interesting. There's this, we found this uh, magazine. It's basically for, this is a magazine for Southern Business and Development. It's basically about, for industrial park developers. And notice the headline. They say, when site searching the south Make sure you inspect the communities downtown first. So why would a you know industrial park developer even care about a downtown when I can put the industrial park in the downtown? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they've kind of figured out it's hard to be a suburb of nothing. <laughs> and you know they, the downtown is always the icon of the community. It's the first thing people will look at, and they will decide whether a community is a healthy community by simply looking at the downtown. So when you reinvest in your downtown, you're reinvesting in the entire community because you're setting the image for the entire place. Luckily, our downtowns are coming back to life all over America. Big cities, small towns, etc. Here's a new study by Christian Wakefield that reports on 500 major American companies that have moved from basically suburban office locations back into downtown in the past five years. Companies like McDonald's and Motorola and General Electric and Warehouse and Room Area, etc., etc. And I could just go on and on. Why do they move? These are the top reasons to attract and retain talented workers, to build brand identity and corporate culture, support creative trust, collaboration. This is the new world headquarters for Amazon. One of the, you know, they want to do a second one, but look where this is. It used to be spread all over Seattle, but now it's in downtown Seattle. How did young people used to get to work at Amazon? Well, they would drive their car. Now you can get to work at Amazon. You can still drive your car there if you want to. You can take a train. You can take a boat. You can ride your bike. You can take the bus. Or you can walk there. And at the end of the day, all these young people are right in the middle of everything. So they think that's pretty good for business. Here's the town my daughter lives in, Frederick, Maryland. In the 1980s, it was a town that was dead and dying and going nowhere. But look at those historic buildings. Today, they've actually invested in their downtown, and they now have 800 downtown businesses. 800. 200 retailers and restaurants. 25 small high-tech companies. This is the fastest growing community in the state of Maryland. It all began with an investment in themselves. So let's talk about preservation for a second. Why? What is the value of historic buildings, neighborhoods, and landscapes? It sometimes I think we sort of take this for granted. You know, some of you probably read some of Thomas Wolfe's famous novels. He's the guy that penned the immortal line, you can't go home again. 
Well, sadly, Tom Wolf, he can't go home again because here's the site of his original house in this parking lot in Asheville, North Carolina. Why are historic buildings important? I want to suggest to you that first and foremost, because these are the places that physically connect us to the past. These are the places that tell us who we are and where we came from. As Daniel Webster once wrote, he said, quote, the man who feels no sentiment or veneration for the memory of his forefathers is himself unworthy of kindred regard and remembrance. At its essence, saving the historic buildings of Maine is about saving the heart and soul of Maine. But it's also incredibly important to your economic well-being as well. So here's one of the first four Main Street towns in America called Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. And this used to be the Pizza Hut. And it was in the former fire station. And of course, one of the principles of Main Street is working to restore the facades of buildings. And they did that. Tells a story about the history of the building. But guess what else happened? Well, the sales of pizza almost doubled. And sustained that over a multi-year period. So saving your history is actually pretty good for your economy. And there's literally dozens and dozens of studies that document all the ways that preservation is good for business. And yes, I believe that pound for pound and dollar for dollar, the mainstream program is the single most effective economic development program in the United States. It's not, you know, giving away a dollar to get a dollar. It's giving away a dollar to get over $30 nationwide in private sector investments. We have a proven track record, jobs, buildings, people, businesses, etc. You know, another reason you think about preservation, what, think what author Frommer says about it. He says, among cities and towns with no particular recreational appeal, those who preserve their past continue to enjoy tourism. Those that have it receive almost no tourism at all. Tourists simply won't go to a city or town that has lost its soul. So saving the soul of the community is actually good for business. So let's talk about how preservation is changing. We do a report at the Urban Land Institute every year where I work. It's called Emerging Trends in Real Estate. We go and interview real estate developers all over the United States. We interview bankers, investors, etc. We ask them sort of what's working in real estate. We wrote something really interesting in the last year's report. We found that office space in restored industrial buildings like old mill buildings are now commanding higher rents in the United States than new Class A office space. I want to repeat that. Offices in restored industrial buildings are commanding higher rents than new Class A office space. Why? Well, because all of these new industries like space with character. And also, you can move things around really easily in these big buildings with all these huge floor plates, etc., etc. So let me show you a few examples of this. So here's a old wharf down in Boston, but now, of course, it's the world headquarters for the Converse Shoe Company. Or how about Starbucks? They took the old Sears Distribution Center and turned it into their world headquarters. Or how about it out in Lansing, Michigan, where they took the abandoned power plant and turned that into the headquarters for a national insurance company. And I could go on. How about hotels? Let's talk about hotels in changing For years, you know, for like 40 years, we didn't build any downtown hotels. Every hotel was out on the highway. I was just in a small city a few weeks ago called Richmond, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And I was staying at this Hampton Inn out on the highway because they're next to the Jiffy Lube, by the way. <laughs> and there was nowhere I could walk to to eat except the Burger King. There was no downtown hotel. But, you know, millennials are telling us that authenticity and interesting are more important than comfortable and predictable in lodging facilities. And they say they actually want to stay in a hotel, in a downtown, in a walkable location. And it turns out that the hotel companies are listening to them. And so now we're building historic hotels at a rate we've never seen before in the United States. And we're taking buildings like department stores and turning them into hotels or abandoned factories and turning them into hotels or an abandoned brewery like this one in Milwaukee and turning it into a hotel or an abandoned elementary school and turning it into a downtown hotel. Here's a company in Oregon, Oregon that has 23 hotels in Washington and Oregon, all in historic buildings. 
And you know, they say this interesting thing. They say, shouldn't a hotel reflect a city and not each other? And you might ask that about all kinds of chain stores and franchises. You know, I always like to show the pictures of the McDonald's up in Freeport, right? And the reason is, not just because it's, you know, the best looking McDonald's in the state of Maine, but because it tells such a story. So, you know, in 1980, when McDonald's came in, they optioned the door house, and they were going to tear it down, put up a typical suburban style McDonald's, and Freeport said no. And McDonald's sued them, and they lost. And then they sued them a second time, and they lost again. But guess what? Three years later, a picture of that McDonald's in Freeport, Maine, appeared in McDonald's annual corporate report as an example of their good community stewardship. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to tell you something. They're not suing anybody for this. They're doing this all over the world. But only in communities that are smart enough, savvy enough, to say, I want something fits with my town. I don't want your off-the-shelf model. What you need to know about chain stores and franchises is that every single one, every one, has plan A, plan B, and plan C. And what gets built depends on you. Let's talk about parks for a second. Parks create value and vitality. I'm going to show you what a small town is. So I go flying off some part of USA all the time, and I go once a year to just photograph small towns in a particular part of America. A few years ago, I went to Southwest Texas, and I photographed 13 courthouse squares. They have more counties in Texas than any other state. They're little counties, and they have great courthouses, so it's easy to get around and do that. One of the counties I went to was, went to this little town called Sulphur Springs, Texas, and they have this beautiful courthouse, and they have a courthouse square around it, and there was absolutely nothing going on here. You know, they had one event a year on the courthouse grounds called the 4th of July. <laughs> Woo! But guess what? So they put in a little splash pad downtown, a splash pad. And guess what? Now all the kids start coming downtown every day. And then the parents started coming with them. And then they started having birthday parties here. And then they started having weddings here. Then movies and concerts and farmers markets and festivals. And on and on. Now they have 300 events a year downtown. Around that little park that nothing was going on. Except the lawyers walking in and out, you know, of the courthouse. Today it was just voted the most improved small town in Texas. It all began with just a splash pad on the courthouse lawn. Let's talk about retail. Retail is changing. You know, for 40 years, everything we built was out on a highway somewhere. You had to get there by car. But I want to suggest to you the future belongs to downtowns and main streets and mixed-use development. And that strip retail is retail for the last century and why do I say that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Let's talk about a couple of them. First of all, because we completely overbuilt suburban retail. We were building retail before the recession five times faster than retail sales. Every time we'd open up a new one strip center, we'd shut down another one, or the Walmart would open and close the Ames, or whatever. And of course, what about the internet? You know, a decade ago, only 3% of purchases were made on the internet. Now it's almost 10%. You know, 50% of all households have an Amazon Prime account. Did you know we lost 89,000 jobs in retail in the first six months of this year? 89,000 jobs. That's more people employed in the entire coal industry in the United States. Nobody's really talking about that. And why is the reason? Well, if you go into a CVS or a Walgreens or right to see the reason, we're getting rid of all the cashier, cashiers. They're replacing them with automation, you know, automated checkout counters, etc. But bricks and mortar is not dead. If it's if it was dead, Amazon wouldn't have bought the Whole Foods. They like brick and mortar stores. And so, but it's changing to be about the experience, which is something that local government, I mean local owned businesses can do really well with. So let's talk about malls for a second. You know, uh, I love this article. This is from USA Today. And this is about the fact that the average amount of time that an American spends in a closed mall or a strip center has been going down for years. People go to buy what they want and they leave. Which is why, of course, we haven't built almost any new malls since the recession. And we've closed 300. Of course, the best malls in every market are doing fine. But we, we estimate we're going to close another 300 malls in the next five years. And 30% of the remaining ones are being turned inside out and have to put housing on top of them. And let me show you sort of a metaphor for America. This is where I live. This is Montgomery County, Maryland. This is our county seat. 
And in the 1970s, we thought it was a great idea to tear down the entire downtown and replace it with this lovely mall you see called the Rockville Mall. But I'm happy to tell you that now we've torn the mall down and put the downtown back. And this is going on all over the United States, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what the future is like. It's about these mixed-use places where you can live, work, and play all in one place. And in many cases, this is the promised land. You know, you remember that Joni Mitchell song, you tear up paradise, put in a parking lot? Now we can tear those parking lots up and put paradise back together again. <laughs> and this is where we already have our infrastructure in front of this. We've got, you know, sewer and water right here. We don't keep needing, you know, we, have, we can develop these gray fields, previously developed places. And this is where you can put your multifamily housing, for example. Because of, you know, it's already a, a site that's assigned for that. So we're going from this all over the country. We're taking a Best Buy like this and we're turning it into a Best Buy like that. You're saying, well, maybe I couldn't do that in a small town like, or I love this, this is, by the way, Stores, Connecticut, where the University of Connecticut is. They never had a town in the stores. They just had the university and some trip centers. But guess what? Now they have a downtown in Stores, Connecticut, too. And it turns out that the students actually kind of like it. <laughs> going to school in a town. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, maybe if you can do something like this in a small town. So that's a new Dairy Queen in a small town of Herndon, Virginia, and has a dentist office upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and all the, all the old rules are changing. So that's a grocery store and a big huge building. That's a Whole Foods and a small footprint building. There's a Walmart and a multi-story building. That's a restored grocery, you know, grocery store and a restored historic building. And all these chains would have told you this was impossible even five years ago. But it's going on everywhere. Let me show you the biggest chain. So here's, you know, Walmart. Let me show you the first Walmart ever built in Washington, D.C. There it is. Okay. Let me tell you about this Walmart. It's, of course, in a five-story building, brand-new building. There are 200 apartments above the Walmart. The Walmart actually has real windows that actually let in real sunlight on the floor of the building. Well, you say, well, where's the parking? It's under the building. You know, and there's a swimming pool on the roof, by the way. There's escalators right there. It's like what we used to call a department store. And it's right in downtown Washington. And why is it there? Because there's only one place left in America with more spending power than stores in our downtowns and in our cities. And so all of these big box companies want to be back in our cities and back in our downtowns. In fact, Target's buying up all the old apartment stores and restoring them, like the Carson Curry Scott building in Chicago or the Galleria building in Portland. Here's a new Home Depot in New York City, and somebody said to me when I showed them this, well, how do you get your lumber home? <laughs> and of course, the answer is, they deliver. Wow, what a concept. And you say, well, you couldn't do it in a small town. Well, welcome to Bentonville, Arkansas. That's their brand new downtown Walmart. One block off the main square. Where's the parking behind the building? And structured parking with solar panels on the roof. So the icon of American suburbia is actually spending hundreds of millions of dollars to turn Bentonville into a walkable, pedestrian-friendly community. But they couldn't get young people to move to Bentonville unless they did that. Well, I'm going to just skip through a couple of these. And I'm going to end by just talking for a few seconds about what I've learned in 40 years in this business. Why is it that some communities are successful and so many others are not? And I want to suggest to you that first and foremost, it always begins with a vision for the future. Now some people might call that a plan for the future. And I grew up in a small town in Alabama. And I can tell you that a lot of people in Alabama would tell me they're against planning. I've probably heard that in Maine, haven't you? They're up against planning. Well, I always would ask them this question. Then you tell me the name of any successful organization, institution, corporation, or community that doesn't plan for the future. Failing to plan simply means planning to fail. As the book of Proverbs says, without vision, the people will perish. Can you imagine a corporation that didn't have a business plan? would have a very hard time finding investors. And the same thing is true with communities. 
Success always starts with a vision for the future, a shared vision for the future. And those visions always begin by inventorying your assets. And then successful communities build all their plans, whether it's a land use plan, an economic development plan, a tourism plan, whatever, around the enhancement of what you've already got. Successful communities use education, incentives, partnerships, and voluntary initiatives, not just regulation. Now, don't get me wrong, I didn't say against regulation prevents bad things from happening, sets a minimum standard of conduct. But we need to use carrots, not just sticks. Successful communities pick and choose among development proposals. All development is not created equal. You know what the biggest impediment to better development in small town America is? It's a fear of saying no to anything. Well, if you're afraid to say no to anything, you will get the worst of everything. And the communities that set no standards or low standards simply compete right to the bottom. And we've got 40 years of proof of that. Communities that set high standards compete to the top. Because they know if you say no, like Freeport, Maine did, to the off-the-shelf model, you will always get better development in its place. Successful communities cooperate with their neighbors for mutual benefit. Successful communities, you know, think about what they look like. Successful communities have strong leaders and committed citizens. Let me show you a couple of quick examples. So here's Chattanooga, Tennessee. It used to be voted the most polluted city in America. Called a patch of rust in the Sun Belt. Well, you know, there's the one city, somebody growing up in Birmingham, used to make fun of Chattanooga. Now, what did that tell you? <laughs> But nobody makes fun of Chattanooga anymore. It's now known as an international model for community revitalization. And it all began with focusing on two big assets, one downtown and two the Tennessee River. And they didn't start with the biggest project first. They started with the smallest project first. But they realized that nothing succeeds like success. So they took that one building and restored it. And that created a sense of belief they could do bigger projects like this. This is the outlet mall of Chattanooga. It's not out on the highway somewhere. It's in downtown and restored warehouse buildings. And then somebody said we need to create a land trust to save the Tennessee River Gorge 15 minutes from downtown. Created the first land trust in the south. And then they said let's put a trail along the Tennessee River. And in 1972 when they first proposed this, the cost was $15 million, which was a lot of money for a small city in 1972. But Chattanooga realized something very important. And that is this. That how much something costs is not the most important question. It is the second most important question. What is the most important question facing any community in Maine? It is what should we do? What should we do? And what we've learned is that money almost always follows good ideas if those ideas grow out of a consensus building process. And so they built that trail. And they were able to do some pretty remarkable things. And by the way, that trail has now leveraged over a billion dollars in new investment, private investment, directly next to that $15 million trail. And because they had a vision for the future, they were able to do some pretty remarkable things like this. That's the Walnut Street Bridge, obviously highway bridge. Tennessee DOT had set aside millions of dollars for its demolition. But Chattanooga said, no, we got a better idea. Let us turn in the nation's longest pedestrian bridge. Now it connects one side of the Tennessee River with another side. You know, here's a small town example. This is Susan City, California, 1985, voted the worst place to live in Northern California. Not surprising, that was their city hall. It was in two double wide trailers. <laughs> this was the only city hall in California that had the rest of the Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> but you know, public buildings are kind of important. And before World War II, they were always our most beautiful buildings, whether it was the courthouse, the library, the public school. And then, you know, after about 1960, we decided cheaper was better. And you know what we've learned from that experience? We've learned that cheaper is simply cheaper. And you know what they said in Susan City? Why would anybody invest in a community that wouldn't invest in itself? And so they built a new city hall right on that same spot. And it was the beginning of a decade-long turnaround in that town, and a decade later, it was probably one of the best places to live in Northern California, but it all began with an investment in themselves. Successful communities inventory their assets. And sometimes those assets are very obvious, like, you know, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, world-class scenery. 
unparalleled wildlife resources or a naturalist Maryland. Unbelievable architectural and historic legacy. Sometimes the assets are not very obvious. Welcome to Lowell, Massachusetts. 1975, it was a dying industrial city. Had an unemployment rate of 28%. Had never seen a single tourist and it thought it had no assets. But what it had was abandoned textile mills and a vision for restoring those mills. And they have done that today. This is now the Charleston, South Carolina of New England. Today people come from all over the country to see what they've done in Lowell, Massachusetts. And people live in these buildings now in luxury apartments, workforce housing. The University of Massachusetts moved back into downtown. Or how about this? The old abandoned torpedo factory on the waterfront in Alexandria, Virginia. Now the most successful art center in the United States. 200 working artists in this building, attracting millions of visitors. Or how about Columbus, Georgia, that realized that adversity could breed opportunity after they had this terrible flood on the Chattahoochee River. Let me show you the exact same spot today. They built this world-class river walk all along that. And then they started taking a look at the river itself and said, you know, maybe we could build a whitewater rafting facility right there in downtown. <coughs> now they got people traveling all over the southeast to go whitewater rafting in downtown Columbus, Georgia. And this is now happening all over the country if you visited most of these facilities. Who would think that in South Bend, Indiana, that the U.S. Olympic team was training for the kayak trials right in downtown. But that's actually what is happening. Or how about Purdue that turned all their flood balls into art galleries? Or how about Rapid City that, you know, used to talk about they didn't have enough parking, but it turns out what they really needed was not more parking, but more parks that would actually bring people <coughs> downtown. Or how about Akron, Ohio that turned their grain elevators into the Quaker Oats Hilton, which began their turn around in downtown. Or how about Poughkeepsie, New York, which has created the small town version of the High Line. This is an abandoned bridge across the Hudson River, 274 feet up. And guess what they've done now? Turned it into a state park, attracting 800,000 people a year walking across the Hudson, 274 feet in the air. Successful communities use education incentives, partnerships, and voluntary initiatives. Why do we educate? In order to reduce the need to regulate. Why do we educate? Because people won't embrace what they don't understand. So, you know, we also need to use incentives. And there's lots of different incentives. You know, free coach might be one, but there's some other ideas. How about historic preservation tax credits or expedited permit review or property tax abatements or technical assistance for design services or form-based codes? I could go on and on. Here's an example. This is the Lone Star Brewery in San Antonio that sat vacant for 20 years until they used an historic preservation tax credit and turned it into one of the great museums of art. Or how about voluntary initiatives like this? This is Yazoo City, Mississippi, and a guy went to Ireland and heard about the Tidy Town program. And the Tidy Town program, they just pass out free paint to downtown business owners. Free paint. Guess what they've done? Painted their way back to my town. So successful communities pick and choose. All development is not created equal. Successful communities have hometown heroes, people like you, people like we heard from tonight, people like we won the awards here tonight. And I understand that it is not always easy getting things done in small town America. <laughs> and I can tell you that there are people like this in every small town in America. And no matter what you propose to do, no matter what the mayor of Westbrook says, there will always be people telling them, can't do it, won't work, cost too much, tried it already. Have you guys heard any of that before? Well, I want to tell you, yes, I mean, there is a very powerful word in America. It's called no. But I want to tell you a more powerful word, yes. Yes, we can make our communities better places to live in, to look at, to work in, to visit. You know, a pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. And you know, if you don't care who gets the credit, you can get a lot done in America. I love this quote from Monty Python. Yeah. <laughs> It says, apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, roads, irrigation, public health, and a fresh water system, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> you don't care who gets credit, you get a lot done. Ladies and gentlemen, a vision counts. 
but implementation is priceless. So thank you so much for having me. And on behalf of the city of West and the downtown Westbrook Coalition, Mayor Sanford would like to present you with the key to our city. Your inspirational words about a sense of place and the importance of the work that we are doing here on the ground. And actually last evening as well when I pulled them into a local Westbrook Economic Improvement Corporation board meeting. We'll serve to further Westbrook's future. Our doors will always be open to you, but in case they aren't, you now have the key. So, thank you so much. Yeah.